I'm Jennifer Hassler and I'm at Georgia Institute of Technology and I want to talk about our open source tool set that we use to target and design field programmable analog arrays. And we're going to go through this a bit of an introduction of the material as then we're also going to talk about and show some hardware, um, some hardware and hardware demonstrations of this material. Now, when we talk about field programmable analog arrays, there's a long history of this, but when we're particularly using it, we're talking about a structure for these large-scale field programmable analog arrays. These have been used in a number of places and used in a number of embedded structures. It's been used for looking at acoustic um, classification and a whole range of acoustic classification structures, talking about embedded learning and classification at microwatt level power levels, and the structure is actually composed of multiple analog and digital components, as well as um, a digital infrastructure processor core and all pro on the remaining uh, programming infrastructure for, the, for this element. So there's a lot of possibilities with this particular structure. So you look at a typical one of these FPAs and they have like a half to a million floating gate elements. And you think that's really great and there's a lot of complexity. But at the same time, you think there's a lot of complexity. And you think, well, does a designer need to go through and select these items individually, looking up tables and figuring things out? You might sit there and think, well, that feels better than layout, but it feels kind of like writing machine code, which may still be better for analog design and mixed signal design, but it's still a fairly complex thing. So is there anything else? Why, yes, there is. We can actually talk about what is an open source tool that actually enables this FPA development. And in fact, the tools have been developed entirely to try to deal with these questions. And when we look at a, a chip like this sort of system on chip FPA, like we showed previously, certainly there's a bit of work in knowing how to build the programming infrastructures and the chip itself. But even that becomes something you want to be able to abstract. There's a whole board infrastructure. There's elements for built-in self-test. But then there's a whole infrastructure for the tools that capture and encapsulate all of this in a useful way. And this is what we're talking about for our open source FPA tool set that we're going to describe. And so it's been, been the work over many, many years, initially out of necessity, even though, in general, most people would think that doing these kinds of tools in an analog space is just a very, very difficult situation. So let's talk a little bit further about these, about these ideas. Before getting into the details, I want to show you at least a high level what the tools look like. We'll demonstrate this in a little bit later on in this presentation. But if you look at the tools, what you see is you have an open source structure Everything is encapsulated in uh, an Ubuntu 12.04 virtual machine and then is actually sitting in Scilab and XCOS, which is, if you're not familiar with it, is an open source MATLAB clone. We've used this infrastructure in classes for over five years. And the reason for using the structure is that we wanted to start off with analog design being a graphical sort of flow language. So imagine similar to Simulink. And this block in the middle is exactly what we mean by circuit design. This is actually showing a particular Hodgkin-Huxley circuit model uh, and how we would use this. Well, the structure has a few specific things. One is there's a nice little button at the top of the virtual machine, which has a CAD SIP button, which is the one button you need to hit to load everything. We put everything into a virtual machine because this became the easiest way to distribute it, not just to our collaborators, but to students. And all they had to do was download the structure, hit one button, make sure the USB is working, and they not only could have the simulation tools running, but the hardware running, um, usually within about a half an hour. Uh, and we would have everything up and working. There is also a whole range of examples, and we actually use a number of different example parts, so that way someone starting off may see blocks that look familiar, and they can immediately start working with them. As well as having things in the GUI that allow you to talk about uh, choosing designs, compiling designs, programming them, um, and a number of other very important features as we typically have found to use. We find that GUIs are fairly um, fairly self-documenting and therefore that we use these, these structures. 
So it becomes one, one tool framework to simulate target and design in this entire structure. And we do actually see the measured output here as well that was um, that we would be would have gotten actually from the output of the chip directly imported through. And what you find is a whole great whole range of action potentials coming out as you would expect. So before digging into the details of the tools, one of the first things that comes to mind is asking questions about whether you can abstract analog structures. And this is actually really fundamental, as you could tell by the fact that we're building blocks all the way through our infrastructure. And these blocks are very, very critical through the entire part. Um, this whole structure is a slightly um, abstracted view, but this is exactly what co correspond to blocks we have in our infrastructure. And it looks, and for most people just using it, they pick up the blocks and make things work, or occasionally there's some one or two issues and they're kind of surprised at this. But what most people, you know, and so that works reasonably well, but what you don't realize when you look at this is that this amplitude detection block, which has a nice print, you double click on it, you get a parameter, would actually be compiled by a number of different circuits. The low pass filter is compiled by another circuit. There are components that actually connect to the processor on chip, both on the input and output structure, and then we also will potentially use shift register blocks that are in, in there. And on top of that, there's other parts. The arbitrary waveform generator involves a microprocessor. The DC voltage block is actually a compiled floating gate circuit, and the C4 block is actually three levels deep of compilation. So what looks like a very nice, simple structure, like what you saw on the previous slide, you realize very quickly that there is a lot that's being abstracted and the capability of it being abstracted. So this is the flow of our FPA uh, tool framework. Uh, at one level, you see that everything comes out as sort of a Scilab X cost kind of framework. At a low level, we get out basically a switch list, which that switch list uh, will allow us with our uh, basically targeting scripts and, and then um, assembly language that we put on the processor to do the programming uh, basically programs the chip. In the middle you'll see that we actually um, utilize VPR and we actually um, take VPR and then add and extend a lot of things around it. Uh, for example, uh, we have a technology file to explain our chip, but our chip is an analog chip. You needed to shift things. Uh, we have extended the file format for Blif because after all uh, Blif, which has you know a format like this, we can actually now put um, transconductance amplifiers in there as part of that block. But basically the way it starts is that there's actually a digital path and an analog path in here. There's a library from XCOS that allows us to go from here down to an analog Blif compilation. Uh, the digital side, we use the VTR part of the tool for that, so we would compile things to Verilog and from Verilog down. And that gives us a netlist and an IO pad block. From there, that can all get piped into v VPR to be able to do the sort of external place and route components, at least of things that are switches. Now, there are some elements that aren't always switches, and so we'll, we handle those separately. And so there's kind of a little bit of a sort of data that gets passed through and around that goes into this VPR to switches, which basically says how do we deal with the programming inside cabs and inside related components. From there, you know, so from there there's sort of all the sort of local interconnect routing, handling things, handling what we call macro blocks, which is very, which has additional code for um, sort of custom configuring a particular cab and then creating the switch addresses and going for there. So what you end up getting is this interesting block that goes from circuits that splits to analog, digital, and assembly and all pulls together when it's done into what's a switch list, which is just basically a list of XY coordinates of switches and values and parameters related to them. And this is directly what is used for programming. So it allows us to take blocks like OTAs and, and various digital components and push this all the way into an infrastructure. Now you might think, wait, if I've got netlist and you know this sort of blif and pad, you're thinking, I can almost see a secondary sort of idea where I could take this out, and if I had some standard cells, I bet I could even take this kind of definition and eventually go to something that's hardware. And it's fair to say that that is something we're working on. The sort of initial thoughts and approaches on standard cells is, is being looked at, and we're continuing ongoing work and likely a tool that we're going to talk about in the future.
so at that point you begin to think okay this whole tool set seems to be basically done but there's one more wrinkle in this which is that your floating gate elements are not dead weight and that's because with your floating gate elements in a crossbar I can actually do things like vector matrix multiplication or other computations right in the routing fabric and if I do that that actually makes it a little more complicated at each of these some of these stages because now my routing is not simply just routing but it's also part of the computation and this is an area where we often have to be very careful what we're putting together there